Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, another episode of the Unlaced Podcast. If you are new here, thank you for turning up. As always, I absolutely appreciate you. And if you've come back again, I absolutely love you. Guys, if you can get on Spotify, give us five stars if you're feeling friendly. Our page is growing, so keep us going. Um, it's been a big year. We always say it on every show and I'm super excited today because uh, this man's actually going to be entering the podcast space soon, but more importantly, has had uh, a hell of a journey across sport and life, uh, particularly over the last few years. But Keegan Hipgrave, welcome to the show, mate. Jackie, how are you, brother? Very well, mate. You finally got here. Two yeah. flights cancelled. Mate, we, we got one cancelled <laughs> last night, late last night. Uh, we had one cancelled this morning. We pushed back, but we made it. So, so I'm pumped. Thanks for, thanks for having me, yeah, We made I know, it. I was like, I didn't think you were going to make it, <laughs> yeah, man. No, we're good. We're good. So what? So what? You, your flight got cancelled last night, then you went home. Flight got, so I was in Sydney, flight got cancelled, just went back home, crashed. And I was like, can I just book an early flight? Like, can we just get the earliest one possible? Uh, okay. Got on the six and then that got cancelled. So we got 7.30 and then- <laughs> just, just to go two just, hours down. Oh, <laughs> Not even. But it was all right. We made it here. So it's all good. Oh man. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm glad to have you on the show, man. For for those that don't know, you're a former rugby league player to the Titans and Parramatta Eels and um, now in the mental health space advocating for, um, obviously- uh, enhancing sort of awareness around the space, but in particular supporting um, people with disability. And we'll go through some of the work that you're doing in that space. But it is an amazing story, everyone, because uh, Keegan was actually um, medically retired a couple of years ago from sports. So um, I'm really sort of interested to know that whole process of your journey because I'm I'm pretty inspired by what you've gone through because it seems pretty amazing and I've done a lot of research of late. So um, I do want to click into that, but you grew up in the Gold Coast. Did it tough. Did it tough. Did it tough on the Goldie. Did it tough, yeah, mate. Palm yeah. Beach High School. Palmy High School. Yep, yep. So grew up on the Goldie. <laughs> that um, looks like the, not the most beautiful high school ever when you drive past have, it. Have you seen that? Have you been past <laughs> no, it? Mate, it we, we grew up. So I, I lived right near the school. So I was a five minute walk from the school. The school's on the beach. Yeah, that's what I mean. So, I'm like, well, this doesn't feel like school to me. So we had a footy program. So it was like a sports excellence you know, high school program, a subject mm. was a sport. So it was rugby league. But then we also had surfing as a like sport. So sports excellence, Mick Fanning, Joel Parkinson, or follow the fish. Oh, you know Fisher? Yeah, yeah. Fish is from Palmy. <laughs> so, yeah, that, fish, so you've fish all got to screw loose out there because Mick Fanning took on a shark. Yeah. Like, and then, then <laughs> fish, fish is just like, he's a walking trance song. Fish is a different cat. He was, he was before my time. So I think he was like five or six <laughs> years older, cat. but he was the surfing captain back in the day. And there was just wild stories of him going through back when we were coming through. <laughs> it used to be wild. It's a lot more cruisy now. They've polished it up. It's an independent school. We've got to wear leather shoes and oh, right. you know, a little okay. jacket and stuff. So it's a lot more cruisy than what it used to be. Um, but yeah, grew up on the grew up on the Gold Coast, grew up in Palmy. Um, and then yeah, just footy was footy was it when I was going through. So was was NRL or for footy the dream for you? Yeah. Was like from the get-go, that was it? Hundred yeah, hundred percent. So I started playing footy when I was eight. And then it probably turned into a reality when I was maybe 16 or 17. So mm. I signed my first contract at 17 for, oh, four, for four years at wow. the Bronx, Brisbane Broncos. So I did all my juniors with them and they do like a little junior development kind of system. Is where that they, like the elite system as well? Obviously in Queensland. Junior and the Bronco, elite. Yeah. The, yeah, the Broncos Broncos were the, yeah. Broncos were the best when I was coming through. So that's why I wanted to be with them. Yeah. So I signed four years there, um, went into a full-time NRL system at 18. Um, which was really cool. That was like, it was eye opening because all, because the Broncos was my team growing up. So I looked up to guys like Corey Parker and Sam Thiday. Oh, and then when I came, Darius Boyd. Yeah. And then when I came in, you're training with them and yeah. like you idolize them. And then when you come through, you realize that they're just normal blows. Yeah. They like to have a beer and stuff like that. <laughs> so it was good. But um, yeah, it was eye opening, mate. It was, yeah. um, it was super eye opening. I, I talk about this with some people like Isaac Claynor from Collingwood. He got drafted to Collingwood and his captain now, Scott Pendlebury, was a poster on his wall. Wow. Like, and so it's funny how like that shit changes. Then you're all of a sudden you're in the dress with him and you got to like play it cool. I, I didn't say like a word. I didn't, I didn't say a word for the first year. I oh, was I you? was so nervous. But were it was, you like training with them, or were yeah, you training, available yeah, for selection? Yeah. Like, yeah uh, so, like how did that work? So usually, so you can train full time with them, but then you would drop back to like an under twenties competition. Okay, right. That's perfect. Yeah. Which was great. So, um, and then you might do like the captain's run. So the day before the session for the under twenties team. Right. Okay. Um, but mate, you would have been the exact same because you went through. You know, well, a young when you're yeah, 14. Yeah, well, mate, hearing your story, it's like 17. I'm like, fuck, it sounds like my thing. Because like, when were yeah. you? You were 14. Oh, I was 14 when I played like the equivalent of VFL. Yeah. Which is like the yeah. reserve grade or like the league under the AFL. Yeah. yeah right. Like the, the best league that's semi-professional. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. In soccer. So- 
But um, yeah, it's scary, mate. Like I couldn't imagine doing it as a seventeen-year-old. Fourteen would have been nuts. Like, well, yeah. Well, it was, it was weird. No, it was more like some with me. It was fourteen. Was it was just like a one-off appearance. Okay. And then like the next day, the VIS gave me a scholarship to make sure that I didn't play there anymore, and came back right. to them so I could be in like the pathway system. It's very cool. So yeah, it, but I like it was kind of playing against older boys my whole life. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, can you do that in rugby? It's probably not nah, safe, right? Nah, like if you do, Soccer, if you go you can get away with it. Yeah, yeah, if you got one year in footy, it's especially when you're younger, especially Massive when you're like ten, difference. eleven, twelve to sixteen. If they're, they're too big. Fuck, man. Um. So when I was eighteen, was training with the Broncos full time, but then would come back and play under twenties. But I was arrogant. Like I wanted, I wanted to play grade. Like yeah, really. when I was 18, I was like, yeah, yeah this is what I'm here mad. for. I want to play grade. Um, I signed a contract four years, which was a really, it's a rare, it was a rare deal back then. But um, that's why you probably got one. Cause you've, you've thought you should. Well, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Well, like, ma- well maybe, I don't, I don't know. I you think say it, arrogance, but I reckon that's just like, I was the same. Maybe, just confidence. maybe, maybe it was confidence. Yeah. Maybe it was a bit more self-belief, but then I put so much pressure on myself to try and get yeah. to that. And then I had a whole heap of injuries. Like, um, this is before I got medically retired with concussion. This was years before. Um, I remember I had five hamstring tears in one year when I was 19. Whoa. And so 19 was the year where I was like, this is it. Like, I'm going to make, like, I'm playing great. Like, I want to play great. I remember I get, I was, did my hamstring first time and then rehab it, tried to come back a little bit earlier because it was an Australian schoolboys, not Australian schoolboys, Australian team that got picked later in the year. Harry Grant was in that team. Oh, so I saw you had yeah, Hazard. Yeah, what a so ledge. Hazard's a great mate. And yeah. so there was a whole heap of the boys who I was really close with. So I wanted to get in that Australian team, the under 20 side. Anyway, end up tearing my hamstring for the first time, came back early to try and get in that team, tore it again. Oh. And then it was just that whole process of trying to get back, tear, trying to get back, tear. And then I remember... I remember the fifth time I tore my hamstring, I was just like, just rattled, fully rattled. I, the One of the boys, because you know what it's like, like in that side, it's just, it's just wild. I remember one of the boys were like, if you're a horse, we'd shoot you. And I was like, <laughs> I was like oh, man. Oh, no. I just, oh, and I was already in a dark place trying, yeah, trying to dude. get, trying to get like, trying to get back and play great. Um, anyway, I called my old boy, my dad, and I was like, man, I've had enough. Like, I can't keep doing this. Like, and so it would have tried been, to pack it in. I was going to pack it in. Five hamstrings, you know what? I'd defy that. I'd test everyone. Well, mate, I was in like- In 12 months, fuck, man. If it was an ACL and it was like, okay, you've got a year out. Yeah, and fair that's enough. one hit. And it's one hit and you can prep. But it was like, it was just the roller coaster of like thinking you're going to be right and then being brought back And then back you don't down. trust your body. Like when you're exactly. running and stuff, like, yeah, change your gears. Well, the, the fourth one, um, I was literally- I was passing a ball with Jared Wallace, who was at the Titans. We were at the Titans together, but he was at the Bronx when we were going through it. And it was literally just a pass of the ball. We were walking past and it just tweaked. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Anyway, the, on the fifth time, I called my oh, dad, I called my manager, Clinton Shafosky, and um, I said, mate, I think, I'm, I think I'm ready to pack it in. And he said, mate, you're 19 years old. Like you've got your, you've got 10, 15 years ahead of you. Like if you pack it in now, you, you're probably going to regret it. And it was just the, it was just the medicine that I needed. Right? He was right. He, he was, was right. right. He was right. Anyway, um, got back, um, mid that next season, I ended up making a trade to the Gold Coast Titans, which just changed everything. That was my whole like hometown team. I had all my friends around me, my family, like I was enjoying my footy. Like I was back training. My hamstrings were strong. Um, and I got to make my debut at the end of that year, which was pretty cool. Dude, yeah. how good's that feeling? It's like, wild. yeah. Did you think like, did you already see that happening or when you were there, it was like, you, it was just surreal, like beyond your expectation. Yeah. When I was at, when I was at Bronx, they had a pretty solid roster. So I realized that, um, look, with the injuries I've had, the boys have overtaken me. I'm probably not going to play this year. Right. And then to have the opportunity to go back to the Gold Coast to a roster that probably wasn't as solid as the Brisbane Broncos, but I was like, there's a chance to debut. There's a chance to cement and spot in this team. I just like, I've got to take it. Yeah. yeah. I've got to take it. And then when I got there and I made my debut, all my friends and family were there. We played the Roosters, Sydney Roosters. <laughs> and um, we, lo- we lost by, I think, a try. And I thought I was only going to get 10 minutes, but we had a bunch of injuries. Ended up playing 60 minutes and I was just caught. Oh, just, man. But it was cool. Mate, it was the best experience. So was that, so your first pro contract was actually with the Bronx? Yeah. Right. Okay. I didn't know that. That's yeah. crazy. So then, and then what the trade was from your end, like you wanted to play more, you went to the Titans. Yeah. And then you're at the Titans for what, a couple of years, really? I was at the Titans for, I think, four or five years. Oh, really? All so that's, up. Right. So, that's, okay. so that's where, maybe four years. So that's where I played the majority of my footy. Like yeah. that's, that's where I played my best footy. Like, is that where you had the most fun as well in enjoyment of yeah. footies too? Well, all my, like I was with all my best mates. Yeah. Like, I was with the guys who I went to school with, Carl Lawton, Kane LG. Um, I had some really great friends like Ryan James, who was the captain. We ended up going through and doing our NBA together. Oh, wow. Um, so he, so I had just, I was having so much fun and was playing good footy, was starting every week. Um, 
which was, yeah, it was fun. But then in 2019, that was the first time, well, don't get me wrong. I've had a heap of concussions throughout my career, but 2019 was the first time where I had three big concussions, right? three big ones where you get pulled off and then you've got, you have to have a week or a couple of weeks and like, follow okay, the whole concussion protocol. rule type stuff. Yeah. The concussion right. protocol. Is there a similarity? You, I mean, I'm sure you're well across this now, but is there a similarity with the ruling in NRL, the same as the AFL, where if you do get that concussion, it's like you're guaranteed to miss a week of footy. And I so think, forth, I think it, it is, it is now, it is now, <clears throat> but back when we were playing, it was, if you want to, if you can pass the concussion protocol, then you right. can play the next week. But now if you get a full knockout and then you get brought off, then you've, I think pretty sure you've already got a week. Well, man. Yeah. Cause yeah, it's, I kind of, I kind of like, um, <clears throat> want to go through what, what I was going to ask about the Gold Coast Titans period was, were you having concussions through those 40 games there? Like, did you experience that? Yeah. So that was 2019. That was 2019. Well, I had obviously had some before that in 2017, 2018. Um, but they were just, they were just small. Had your, at this point, say we're stuck in 2019 here, because what year did you go to power up? It's like 2020, 2021, 20, 2021, 2021. Yeah. So at this point, 2019, is your head even wondering to like, this isn't safe? Yeah. Well, so, so you know what it's like, like going through, you just want to play great. Yeah. So, of if, course. so if you get hit, if I get hit in the head, it was just <clears> disregard <throat> anything that I could do to play great. Like that's all I wanted to do. So in 2019, when I had the big concussions, when you get three big ones like that, you got to go and see independent neurologist. Right. So I, throughout that year, so I stopped playing, um, went and saw the neurologist and he, we go through a whole test. Like you get your brain scanned. It's a whole two day of testing between like literacy, numeracy, problem solving, um, working memory, you go, it's a whole couple days, maybe a day or two days of like testing. And you, you cooked by the end of it cause you're working so hard, like mentally. And then after that, they said, you've got to have a minimum of six months off. You know, you're not allowed to play. Um, and so I was like, oh, okay, this is pretty tough to hear, but yeah, sure. Like I'll, I'll do what I have to do and then I'll get back. What, what did they found though for them to warrant giving you six months Is so, it just because they didn't want you to have more yeah. pressure being put on your head from the hits or was there actually something they'd identify? So when, before the season, you do a baseline testing of where your mental's at. So you do like a online cognitive test with like <coughs> cards, the guys who have played, they'll get it. Yep. And it's pretty much just like a, a set of cards and you can do memory. So have you seen this card before? Yes, no. Or, and they measure reaction time. So you get a baseline and then you'll do that after a concussion mm. when you're in the year, throughout the year. Whoa. And so if you pass, then you can play. If you don't pass, then you don't play. And then- when I saw the neurologist, we did that, but more in depth. And then he said, obviously he's seen the hits, you know, he's seen that he's seen the hits that happen that cause the concussions. So, yeah. Do they have, because I haven't seen those. Yeah. Like I, I probably don't like them. Yeah. I don't know if you can stomach watching them, but like, are they big hits? Cause sometimes in AFL, we see people that, um, maybe they get concussions often, but sometimes it's very innocuous ones yeah. where it almost doesn't look like they get hit too hard. Yeah, it's my, like they just get hit on the right sweet spot or something yeah. and they drop. You yeah, know? Mine, mine were, so the first thing I looked at was my tackle technique. I was like, my tackle technique must be off. Mm. So I went back and looked at all the videos, all my tackle technique, all the concussions that I had. And they were, most of them were foul play. Like one of them was like a swinging arm to the head. The other one, when I was on the ground oh. and they tackled in, like tackled their shoulder into my head. So there was like little, so all of them were penalties. So, so, and then they, they weren't your fault. They weren't my trying fault. to say. Yeah. 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 Okay. Don't get me wrong. There was probably a couple that were my fault. <laughs> yeah. I played pretty hard and aggressive when I was playing. Like that's sort of that's, what I did. That's embraced in the game. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, and so, yeah, we, they were all tackle technique. I was like, well, there's not much I can do. So I had six months off. And then in that six months, I was just, I was just itching. I was just like, I just did. I was like, I, when I come back, I'm going to do everything I can to get back into the team and go well. So I was running, I was doing gym. I didn't have to do any contact or wrestle. So I was as fit as I was going to be. All right. So uh, you took it, you took that, um, that news is like a positive in the nah, sense well, of uh, like I wanted well, to play. Yeah, obviously, but you still, your response was not like fucking, oh shit. Nah. It was like, get in, get working, get fit, which is probably. Yeah. It was like. Not, not, the, not, not an easy decision. Well, it was like, let, what's next? Like, yeah. let's like, I can't change what's happened. Mm. You know, I can't change it. We, that's when COVID hit. So the comp actually stopped for another six months. So that six months turned into 12 months. Right. So, so I didn't play footy for 12 months. And then the NRL were good. They were one of the first codes to get back playing after COVID. COVID hit. Yeah. So we went, um, we went back in and then that 2020 season, I got to play the whole year, okay. which was great. So was that, where was, where was the year where you felt like the most consistent footy, you felt the healthiest? Probably. Was it earlier than 2020? Early, yeah. yeah okay. Probably like 2018, 2019 okay, when I was good. like 21, 22. That's when I was like, yeah, that's when yeah. I was going for it. Fuck yeah. man. Do yeah. you just like to go 
to this, do you, do you miss that feeling now? Like, or yeah. is there a pure, or is there a part of you that's sort of relief to kind of be away from it? Um, it's it's hard, mate. Like, I always wanted to play forever. Like, I wanted to play into my thirties, like mid, early mid thirties. You know, mm. that was always the goal, and that's always wanted what I wanted to do. Um, but yeah, I, I miss it hundred yeah. percent. Like I don't, I don't miss the head knocks and I don't miss the hits. Like yeah. I look at the the boys playing footy now and I think I can't stomach that. Like I, I don't yeah. want that here, but the competitive at- atmosphere yeah, that. and the growth, like I'm sure you've yeah. experienced that all the time, right? Yeah. Like where you want to be just something where you can exert that energy. Yeah. Yeah. We, I don't know. I'm still like, how do you, how do you exert that on your end? Well, yeah. I play five aside through the week and I turn into like the biggest prick. Really? Yeah. Oh my God. Like yeah. five aside soccer. I'm like, I'd go home. I'm like, why did I say that? Why did I do that? I should have tackled that kid like that. Do you ever think? Like, I'm just so stupid. Cause I'm like, I've got nowhere else to like push this competitiveness. How old are you now? 30. Do you ever think like you wish you could have gone back and played? <clears throat> yeah. I've always, I always wish at 21, 22, someone like the guy that told you don't give up yeah. was there to tell me that. Cause I was like. Yeah, your actual journey is quite quite interesting because it kind of aligns to mine from what I saw anyway. You played like in all the Queensland youth teams and the Australian schoolboy teams at rugby. So you kind of had like you're in the pathways and in that recognition. So I was in like all of those things on the soccer front. And because I was like, it was like I was trying to sprint to the top, you know, because I'd, I was just always there. And then when I got there and like injuries and slowing down and I'm not getting a contract, you got to go on trial. And I'm like, what? Like I should just be getting this, this elevator lift to the top, you know? So I was like, fuck. But then, so I just stopped because I was hating it. Like my headspace was gone. My body was like giving way on me, but like probably didn't have anyone saying like, dude, you're just fucking 21, bro. Like and just, and it's so, slow we're, down, we're you know? so young and that's the thing. Cause we're young and we're dumb and we just, we want everything now. Yeah, you do. Right. And I think that was probably, you know, a little bit of my undoing as well, where I wanted everything now, you know, when I did my hamstrings, I wanted to get back and play great. Yeah. When I had my concussions, I just wanted to get back and play. And then, you know, at the end of 2020, 2021, um, I was like, well, you know, I've yeah. had these concussions. I got, went back and played. Then the conversation was like, okay, well, what am I going to do? Like, am I going to stay at the Titans or am I going to move on? Yeah. And then I was like, well, I want to be a part of like a premiership winning side. Like, So I'll- you were thinking like that. So would, when you left the Titans, were the Titans, um, was that like a mutual decision or were you it was, think? It's very much, yeah, it was very much mutual. I think like right. it was, yeah. it was like, I think. I could see, I could see that they probably wanted to go in another direction, mm-hmm. and I could probably, and I saw the writing on the wall. So uh, you you made the call as well. Right. So we made Smart. the call, um, which was great. And then I caught up with Brad Arthur, who was a Parramatta coach at the time, and then I just loved everything that he was about. Like he would he would tell you how it is. He was one of those really hard coaches that would just he wouldn't beat around the bush, which is what I resembled with, and is what I like what I wanted. Yeah, respected. Yeah. And they were they were top four side. Like they lost in the semi final the year before. So I was like, this would be that's a, exciting. This would be a mad place to come. Yeah. And so I went there, went to Parramatta, um, got to play, I think, 10 games, but they were the same thing as the Bronx. Like they were a competitive side. Like they had however many state of origin players in there, like Regan Campbell Gillard, Junior Polo, like internationals. And I was like, well, if I can even just get a spot on the bench, like I'll be pumped. <laughs> um, I'll be, you know what I mean? Yeah, well, like, you're, cause you're at, what, how old are you at this point? Like 20, 21? 23. Oh, you're oh, 20, 24. Sorry, 24. 24. Okay. Yeah. How old are you now? 26. Oh, you're 26. Yeah. yeah. It's only a couple of years ago this for you. Man, I'm sh- that's why I look so old. I'm stressed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> nah. I'm stressed. Nah, you don't. Nah, nah. We you are- just get the sun more than <laughs> us, mate. <laughs> We're pale as anything here. Yeah. Melbourne's good. I like Melbourne. <laughs> Melbourne's good. But yeah, anyway, so in that year when I got to Para, same thing, like three big concussions um, and a heap of little ones. Got to play a fair bit of grey, but was going in and out of like the main side and like the equivalent of EFL, like the, mm, the reserve grade. Yep. So I was going back and forth. And then the last game of the season against Penrith was playing grade and then went to jam on Tavita Pangai, who was an old like mate of mine. Obviously he's a mate of mine, but he's an old teammate. Yeah. And I jammed him on the line and he's a big guy. Like for anyone that knows Tavita, he's like this huge solid guy. Anyway, came off second best and had the whiplash and head hit the back of the ground and then was like completely out. Like, don't remember that whole game. Um, Still to this day? Yeah. Like, I go back and look at clips and then like, I think that kind of sparks my memory a little bit. Do you, for like most of the hits you've had in from a concussion point of view or just there's specific it, it slowly, ones? It slowly gets worse. So 
Mm. When I was younger, I'd get a hit and I'd bounce back really quickly. But then as the years went on and the more concussions I got, it becomes more receptible to them. So you see the guys in the AFL who might just get a little hit. They might be a little bit more prone to being concussed because they've had so many. So that yeah. was me. So I didn't need a big hit in order to feel rattled after a game. Don't get me wrong. That last one was pretty solid. Like the, con- the symptoms that I had after that one was the worst I had in all previous concussions. Like I had a headache for two months afterwards, like consistent throughout the day, throughout the night. I couldn't sleep. Um, my, the biggest one was my emotions. Like my emotions were just going up and down. Like I'd be super happy and then I'd be brought down to tears. Like I remember going to see my granddad for his birthday and he wasn't doing too great. Like I didn't know how many, like how many times we were going to see him. And I'm just sitting in the car, like driving there, just angry. I was like, why am I so angry? Like I've got Mm. no, like I don't. And, but it's weird because you know, your brain's recovering. Like you, you're aware of it. But then you're, you're all, still, feel you're still angry and it's yeah, like, this isn't can't me. Change it. Anyway, I was, went to lunch, like got to see him for his birthday. And I remember just sitting there just angry. And then I got back in the car and I remember thinking like, what am I doing? Like, you're not even going to get to see him like however many more times. And then I remember just breaking down and I told my missus at the time and, um, and she was fully aware of it. Like my family, they could see. And then she was like, yeah, look, and they s- told me how they could see me like being real angry and irritability and like. Just I couldn't process. I couldn't process it. And my brain was just recovering. Like that's yeah. that's what was happening. Um, touch wood. Like I'm good now. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm F- almost absolutely. two almost two years down the track now. Um, <clears throat> after that last concussion. Um, but yeah, and then after that last one, went through and did all the neuro like neuropsych testing um, with an independent doctor, Andrew Gardner and Chris Levi in Newcastle, um, which were great, and they came to the conclusion that I should medically retire from footy. Wow, man. Yeah. That is crazy. So as of now, like, do you, obviously two years on, do you still see fluctuation of like emotional um, sort of feelings within yourself or not really? Because nah. that's one of the big things with concussion that depending on how bad they are, like why it's severe is obviously the impact to your brain and so forth. But the actual, from a personal perspective behind closed doors, it's like a roller coaster of emotion. Like you're up and down and stuff like that and what you're saying. So Yeah. I um yeah, I don't feel it so much now. That's awesome. I definitely I definitely felt it heaps in those post months. Um, but then you don't you don't know. Like I wonder what my I wonder what I would be like if I didn't have all those head knocks. Mm. So for me, I can't change the past. No, mm. I can't like I love footy and I love everything that's footy give that has given me. It's given me the ability to work hard. It's given me the ability to, you know, Drive discipline, under pr- yeah. discipline. Meet. I met the best people throughout my footy yeah. career, um, but I wouldn't. And I wouldn't. So I wouldn't change it. But it's like, okay, now I realize I've had all these concussions. I've had all these hits to the head. So what can I do now in order to be better going forward? Like, what can I do to get my brain right? You know, what can I be doing in my sport, and what goals do I have in order to like help me going oh, yeah. forward? Hey, legends! Just a quick break in this episode to thank our partners, Dabble, the gambling agency where you dabble socially and gamble responsibly. Please only bet what you can and are willing to lose. Now, Dabble is one of the great platforms out there. I absolutely love using it. Very similar to Instagram, where you can follow some of the head honchos in the different sports, copy their bets, and get some good wins on the board. Now. Fortunately for me, I've been working with Double for over a year. This year, we are doing a stream every Tuesday night. It's called Jake's Take. It's from 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. where you can go in the Double app. You can join me. We get guests on every week. We bet on the dogs. We have an absolute ball, and they're talking about sport and cutting up the shop around what's going around town across all codes. So come on down, check it out. Double socially, gamble responsibly, and let's get back into the episode. Can you take me into, like... Um, I guess the emotional standpoint of when the neurologists were telling you, like, this is our medical advice that yeah. you should stop. Like, did you see that coming or was that as painful as that is to say on my end? Yeah, no, mate, it's, it's tough. Like, mm. it's so tough when, when the neurologist who's someone who's been doing this for years says, mate, it's, it's probably, I recommend that you medically retire. It's a heavy conversation. And I guess I could kind of see it coming because in 2019, there was some background chats with the club that I was at the time. So he's like, yeah, maybe you should re- like, maybe you should retire. So there was murmurs. So there, so there was little bits. And then, and so obviously you're nervous and then you're like, if I get a couple more hits, is this going to be it? And then in, when para, when I was at para and I got all those hits and then having the conversation with the neuro, like neurologist, it was pretty heavy. Um, but it was weird because like, I kind of agreed with him in a sense where, where it was like, yeah, like I want to be good when I'm 40, 50, 60, like, I don't want to end up like some other guys who 
you know, can't put a sentence together and they can't articulate their thoughts and they can't remember what they did yesterday or five minutes ago. So that, that stuff really scared me. And then, so I agreed, I kind of agreed with him. I was like, yeah, like I, I want to be good. The hardest part or the most challenging part was probably telling the coach, Brad, because that was the first time I had the conversation with him that I was going to medically retire. So we spoke to how it worked was I spoke to the neurologist, did all the testing. They went back and reflected. And then we had a sit down and he said, mate, you should retire. Um, flew back the next day. I called Brad. I called Brad. Um, he missed the call. <laughs> and then so, <laughs> so and I was just sitting there like, oh, Fuck, gonna, I just want to get have, it over. I'm going to have to have this conversation. And then, because I hadn't said it out loud. Like I hadn't really. I hadn't Did talked. anyone know at this point, like around you My and your mom, team and stuff that like you were going to go for a meeting that where this advice they, could be coming? That Well, it was the end of the season. So we had the last game. The boys played semifinals, got knocked out. And so everyone dispersed. Like everyone goes on holidays. So everyone, no one really knew. It was yeah. only my family. Fuck. It was only my family. And then I remember I got, Brad called me and I was like, mate, like I'm, um, this is what they said. Like, I think I'm going to medically, re- I think I have to stop. And he was so good, mate. Like the, he was, he was just like, mate, you got to think about yourself. You got to think about your family. Like we love footy, but footy's not everything. Like no. you've got a whole life after footy and mate, you would get it better than anyone. Cause you've been in it. It's like when yeah. you're in it. It's just your whole life and it's a bubble. Consume. But then when you step out of it, it's like, well, there's actually some really fun things that I'm excited about. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's um, it was tough. But yeah, I don't regret it. I don't like I love it. So the, yeah, well, of course. Yeah, man, you're this is what one one of the things why you're you're inspiring is your the in the manner that you've sort of bounced back or moved on or transitioned as um if you like. But the so the emotions you got when you were told that was was it relief? Because you obviously, or was it more like you're gutted, but at the same time you had comprehension of why you had to transition or yeah, stop? I was, I was sad and I was not angry, but I was just, I was sad and I was frustrated that this was the situation I was in. But then I also agreed where it's like, okay, well, there's nothing I can do about this. Like, this is, this is what's going to happen. Um, and I agreed with him. So I was like, okay, well, what can I, what, what's next? Mm. And so I think that's always been, if there's anything I can fall back on, it's always like, what's next? Well, if I can't do this, well, what's next? Mm-hmm. Um, which has been good. Yeah. I think that's helped heaps. Um, and yeah, mate, it was just, I think, yeah, it was sad, but then it was also kind of after I sort of mourned the, the loss yeah. of the footy career, yeah. it was like, well, all right. Well, Are you what, still mourning? No, nah, I'm good, mate. I'm good. How long, good how, how long did that last? Uh, mate, it's probably probably a couple months. Jeez, that's not that long. No, it wasn't. Yes. And, but don't get me wrong. Cold guy, man. Cold well, breakups. Yeah, yeah, cold it just breakups. moves on. <laughs> well, mate, like people, people always ask me, like when you, like before, like, do you miss it? Like, do you miss playing? I was like, there was one part last year when um, I went and watched the State of Origin boys. And this is this was a time when I had a lot of mates who I w- was coming through with that were making their, you know, Origin at Boo, like Callum Ponga, Harry Grant, um, same year that Harry played, mm-hmm. um, Paddy Carrigan, Tom Flegler. So these were the guys who I was captaining at Bronx when we were in the under-20s competition. So these were the – and they're my best mates. And I have, like, I love that they're playing. I have so much respect for them. But I remember sitting in the, in the, like, in the stand – thinking, oh, wow, that actually would have been really cool because, mate, playing State of Origin is just nuts. Do you know what? Uh, just uh, not to um, go over what you said, but I've, I've got this feeling and I just want you to validate this. Is it number one to play for your state yeah. than your country? 100%. What? And why? Yeah. Why? I like, don't know. Because yeah, I've noticed that. I'm like, I was thinking that the other week. I'm like, man, the, the amount of interest in Origin versus like when the Kangaroos were winning the World Cup, I'm like, it seems a bit like different. It's weird, and because obviously, like Melbourne is very much AFL dominated. Yeah, but Sydney. But we love Origin, like yeah. even Victorians. We're like fucking glued to it. Like it's, we pick a state. Yeah, right. Like I'm a Queenslander. That's great, yeah, mate. That's what I love I'm, to hear. I'm a Queenslander. That's what I love. I mean, to I lived in the Gold Coast, but yeah, like yeah. anyone goes to New South Wales, I'm like, why? Right, we do, yeah. Like, um, but no, I don't know what it is. I think it's because when you're going through the schoolboys, you just get this like ingrained into you that you hate. New South Wales, or you <laughs> hate Queensland. Yeah, it's and like so you've fucking got this violent raw, man. You've got this raw passion where you're like. It's just mad. And then they go into the camp and it's this whole thing. And when we were going through in the juniors, like when you're in the 16s, 18s, under 20s, then you would mix with the older origin boys. And Mm -hmm. so you do cross camp stuff. So you got to see and you got to be around those guys. So yeah, I think most of the guys and even the guys who play, like, I'm not sure if you spoke to Harry about it, but like, yeah, you'd, you'd want to be an origin more than Aussie. Yeah. 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 Like uh, when I was talking, like you'd want an origin to Harry, like this before the one that's just gone. It's like a pretty like chest out. Yeah. 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 Like he's such a little like, yeah. 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 
think of that. He's just a cheeky guy. Yeah. Like he didn't really give two fucks, but I'm like, that's what makes him cool because yeah. he doesn't give a fuck about he's what he's achieved. Do you know what though? Just on your comment with that, like I don't know if you're anything like me. But I always like, I get the odd fluctuate. I'm now not so much, but like five, six years, even after, like after I came out, there'd be like just one or two little moments that would make me fl- like fluctuate. It's like, oh fuck, I, I wish I had still been playing. Do you but like 90% of the time I'm fine. Yeah. Just like little, little things like, well, like Harry Maguire, when he signed for Man U for 60 million. And I'm like, fucking one day I just remember like pantsing him on a soccer field. What do you do in those situations? One, does, you know what? This is so funny. And, uh, I never really did anything. And then when the Harry Maguire thing happened, I was on a plane coming back from the UK and I was like, how the fuck has he been signed for 70 million? And like played against him and like, didn't think he was that good. Yeah. So I'm like, I can compete. Yeah. And this guy's like generational wealth now. Yeah. So I called Jackie Loud up, the sports psychologist. And I went and saw her for a session. Yeah. Like that's the only time I've ever done that. Yeah. Because I was like, I'm still feeling like this. That's good. You reached out because most of the guys were just sat on no, that group. I've had her on this show. I'm actually, I, Brandon, I want to get her back on. Um, but she's, have you, do you know of it? Yeah. She's, so she's the uh, Storm, Collingwood, um, Collingwood Netball. I think just those three, like sports psych. Yeah. Yeah. But then she does like her own, like, um, um, general sort of practitioner work as well. Like yeah. got her own clinic that she works at. Yeah. But yeah, she, um, like pro, pro athletes. So she, she speaks to the bo- those boys all the time. Yeah. She gets it. Yeah. Like in the AFL, she's on the bench now. Yeah. yeah. So when players come off, they like turn over the ball three times. They're like, <gasps> they get stage fight. She'll just like walk through oh, and like gather, is, gather yourself. Like, that stuff is, stuff. that's so interesting. Genius, that it? stuff is so cool. Yeah. Um, that's what they do now. I'm like, bro, I would have loved that. On I needed that. Field. We needed that yeah, when like, we were coming head through. Lost for 10 minutes. Like I'm, you know, just yeah. like someone just to steady the ship. They can do that in AFL. They have that privilege because the, the rotations are so high. That's so cool. Um, but yeah. yeah, just to come back, come back full circle. Like when, when I was watching the game and having, being on the sideline, I remember thinking like, yeah, that would be cool to be in it. And then all that stuff came out about Paul Green. So Paul Green uh-huh. was, um, he was a state of origin coach, played however many hundreds of games in the NRL, um, older guy, he ended up, um, committing suicide. Um, North Queensland, North Queensland coach. coach yeah. yeah mate, Queensland. I love that North Queensland team as well. That actually hit me Yeah, because I used to watch that team all the time. Like Matty Bow and Jonathan Thurston. Mate, he was a great and such a great guy, family, like wife, kids. And then just all of a sudden, like just. Did they find like the, CTE and stuff? Yeah. In his brain? One of the worst cases of CTE that oh. you've seen. And so, and so when I saw that and all that came out, I was like, what am I doing? Like the whole reason yeah, that I got, yeah, yeah. the whole reason I stopped playing footy was so I'm sweet later on. And so after that moment, I don't, haven't had one moment. I would, like, if I was you, I would not have back. one regret about it no. because of, because of how like lethal um, yeah. that is at times. So, but it's so interesting. Like I think my next, are you comfortable like talking about like CTE and stuff? Or hundred percent. Cause like, I, like I didn't want to actually bring it up cause it's like, it's, it's actually quite like, severe right mate i am so interested yeah, like my, I, i'm fascinated by it too I, I watched concussion last night that's how that's how like relevant this really? shit is to me yeah i watched mate, concussion i watched concussion after i had a full-blown knockout uh, hey, no, i think where was i i think i was fuck, in, I don't know if that's oh, a good time to watch mate, it. it was the worst i tell i i tell this, <laughs> oh my God. I, I tell this story because I, oh. I remember getting knocked out and my adrenaline was so pumped i was rattled i couldn't sleep and then I just was flicking on the TV. You know, you probably, like, you know, when you're after a game, your adrenaline's so pumped. Yeah, like, yeah, no yeah, one can sleep. sleep You've had a bunch of coffees before. Yeah. And I remember turning it on and concussion was on. I was like, oh, what's this? It'd be cool. And I remember watching the whole thing. And afterwards I was like, this man, is it's nuts. one of the scariest, scariest, like most fascinating and amazing movies I've watched because like I've been knocked out too. Really? Yeah, I've been knocked out. And like in soccer, I reckon soccer players going to have it because we had the ball That's what at violent say. speeds, which like doesn't seem like a lot. Yeah. But like at the same time, you watch that and the way it's described, and it's like, well, it's possible. Hundred percent, it like, is. Like the amount of times I would have headed a ball just by being at twenty-one yeah. would have been like twenty thousand, thirty thousand times. Yeah, and I'm like, I hadn't even hit my career. There's, so imagine people like pros. <laughs> but the the cool thing is, is that there is some really exciting like research and studies that are coming out of America, mainly the yeah. NFL. Um, there's a guy called Dr. Daniel Amen, and obviously Bennett Umalu, who was yeah. based on the yep. concussion movie. Will Smith. Will Smith. Yeah, yep. yeah. So there's a bunch of really cool research coming out, especially Dr. Daniel Amen. He's the guy that I've been following a little bit now. Mm-hmm. He's the first guy that I've seen that can provide like a rehab program for guys who are coming out of the NFL mm-hmm. with, with brain, with traumatic brain injury, yeah. which is really exciting to see. Cause I've never like the, the, the chat with my neurologist when I finished up was like, okay, well, what, are, what can I be doing? He's just like, well, you probably shouldn't be drinking that much. Like drinking is the worst thing for it. drinking and like recreational drugs, yeah. actually even just any drugs in general. Um, 
being stressed out, but there's also some really cool things that you can do like sleep, like sleep is huge. Um, doing something you're passionate about exercise, having oh, purpose. Wow. There's all these little things, supplements like, and so this guy, Dr. Daniel Amen, who, um, has, he did a lot of the concussion studies in the NFL. Like he's done these research and the studies. And so he talks about it really well. I actually want to go over to America next year and try, I have never said this, but I want to try and go over there and just to see what it's like um, and see what he can provide in terms of like, because he, what he does is he does a spec scan, which measures blood flow throughout the brain. So mm -hmm. he can look at the, look at your scan and say, all right, well, you're, you know, you've got less blood flow in this part of the area. You've got more blood flow in this part of the area. And they can say, all right, well, this is why, you know, you have problems, like problem solving, or this mm -hmm. is why your memory is not so great. And he goes into a deep dive into like every single part of the brain. And then he can provide a rehab program of what you should be doing and what supplements you can be taking. Amazing. So which that's is, kind of like a, is kind of like building a, the, one of the first guys to build a remedy around like how to balance and yeah. live with it or well, and, but get better. He does it for everyone. So not just, not just oh, athletes, not just, not, oh, just, not, just, not athletes. just athletes. He does, you know, though he did a, a case where, um, you know, it was a, a husband and wife who had been married for 10, 15 years and they were about to go through a divorce and they were just hating each other and they sat down and this was like the last step because he's a psychiatrist. So it's like a psychology, but with medication, it's a psychiatrist, I think. I think. Mm. And um, so they sat down just before they got divorced and then they're like, look, we've, we've, you're going through all these traumas, we're about to break up. And then the guy, Dr. Daniel Amon was just like, well, did you marry? Like, cause she was like, he's an asshole. And then he's like, well, has he always been an asshole? Like, did you marry an asshole? He's like, no, he was great when we first started getting together. And he said, well, when did he turn into an asshole? He's like, oh, it was about five years ago. It's like, well, what happened five years ago? And he's like, oh, well, he started this new job where he was like sealing boats with certain types of pain and sealer. And then, so they attributed the toxins like they were in that to the change of his brain because they measured, they looked at his brain and then he's like, mate, do you drink and do you do drugs? Because you brain, your brain looks like an addict. It looks like someone who's like an oh alcoholic. Oh my God. It's like, you look like someone who's like been abusing drugs for the last five years. And then it's like, oh, well actually like I started working in this job. So anyway, they moved, moved him out of that certain part of the department. And so there's little, there's a million stories like that. So it's not just head knocks. It's like the whole brain health. Oh my journey, God. Which yeah. is so interesting. Cause, um, is this like, obviously the, your journey and what you went through, is that why you're, you're a big advocate around mental health yeah. or is it for outside of that journey? Like you just naturally always were. I, I, I mean, it makes sense, right? Yeah. It's it makes, well, it makes why. more it makes more sense now, like going mm. through the whole concussion and, and medically retiring, doing the transition, similar to what you've gone through. But no, my I started getting into mental health probably seven, eight years ago. Actually, probably longer. I started doing stuff with Movember seven, eight years ago when mm. I was at the Titans. Yeah. But no, I first had, like my first encounter with mental health was when I lost a mate mm. when I was 17. So that schoolboys, the schoolboys carnival um when we were in the Queensland team, there was a guy called Regan Grieve who was our captain. Me and him, we, we were captains of the Queensland side. We were roommates. Um, we spent all of our time together, me, him and Kurt DeLewis, we all roomed together. Um, and it was so much fun. This is the guy that, you know, everyone loved. Like he was happy. He was funny. Everyone respected him. He was our captain. Like he was mm. our captain. Um, we both got picked in the Australian side. There's a really great photo of like me and him just after being picked, like in our Aussie jerseys. And it was like, it was the funnest time. And then we, he broke his leg. He broke his ankle in that competition. So he got picked, but he couldn't go away. So we were going to go to France and England for six weeks. We had a six week tour over there, which was nuts. And it's what everyone wants to do. Anyway, he couldn't go. So he didn't go because he broke his leg. Um, so they had to get someone to re replace him. Anyway, we all finished school. Um, these are this time where guys are like going into starting their NRL debut or NRL like pre-seasons. Mm -hmm. um, and then he ended up committing suicide at the Australia Day that following year, 2015 which was just like, oh, goosebumps. Yeah, yeah. Thought, yeah. Um, and so that was the first time that I had an experience with it. I remember thinking like, fuck, how can this guy like, that's been loved by everyone. Like, and, but like, we didn't know, like mm. I had no idea. I was, I think he was one of my best mates, like in the camp mm -hmm. and I had no idea. Yeah. And so ever since that moment, I was like, I'm fuck, like, I'm never going to let that happen again. I'm going to, like, oh, it's so going through Titans, going through Bronx, Para, like, I want to be the guy that my mates can talk to. Mm. And so that's what I want to do. That's why I do stuff with Movember. Um, we did a Movember fundraiser at the end of every year where we'd like shave off our moustaches and we'd like auction them off to like people in the crowd. We'd all have a bunch of beers. Like, it was great. Um, but it just to, to normalize the conversation and normalize, like, it's okay to speak up and break down the barriers of stigmas of boys and girls to like normalize the conversation and not bottle it down because the more we bottle it down, the more we suppress it, the more it's probably going to likely come out in a trigger mm -hmm. event.
Yeah, dude, it's it's crazy, man. I'm sorry for your loss with that, but it's fine. I've um, I know how that feels. Like that's that's what's made me passionate about it. It's my um, best mate in high school. Really? Yeah, took his own life. Like, um, oh, what was it? It's like four or five years ago now. Yeah, but it was um, it came from nowhere in my eyes because I was playing interstate. Yeah, um, and we'd keep in touch here and there. He's like one of those friends, like. When I see him, nothing changes. Yes, yeah. But he went through this spiral of like six months and like people were aware that there was like an imbalance and sort of stuff in the brain or something was wrong. But what I, what was fascinating to me, cause I was like you where like, like how didn't we know? Like yeah. how couldn't we do something? Was I, I speak to his mum still like now really? and I went and visited her and I was, she would tell me that when he would get home, he would like, no one would know when he'd gone to the boy's house, like he was feeling bad and he'd get home. And he'd be like, I fucking, I like just hated it. And like he put on a facade and a face right. and then he'd get home and just let it all out. And it's like, no one knew. And I was like, man, this is like, that's crazy that that's people, people can do that and people can feel that way. And like, we can be next to them and have no idea. But this is, this is, this is why we got to do it. Yeah. Like well, that's, that's why, that's why having this conversation now and speaking about it and mate, and like, and is mate, really important. It's so important. And like, yeah. and mate, thanks for having me on. And then this is the whole reason why the podcast started. Yeah. So, so I've obviously like, a, I've been doing a deep dive into mental health for a little bit and I want to do more. Like I'm just, just uh, I've done an so application. What, what are you calling it? It's called Keegan and Company. Right. So, so it, first step's not like you're, you're building the building the episodes up now or you're already live we we're live so mate, Whoa, we're get live on, get on it people <laughs> we're live no mate we're live we we launched a little trailer two weeks ago <clears throat> and mate, mate the response was so overwhelming to be honest like i just got a mate to build this little trailer of like parts conversations and me just doing like a really honest piece of camera and we didn't even have a kind of didn't really have a script we just spoke about it and he just cut clips of it and mate we posted it and it I think a heap of the boys reposted it and it must have re resonated with a whole heap of crew because they like, they reposted it. They liked it. I think we had over like 200,000 views on that. Just like one little clip. And it was the first one. We just started the Instagram. There was no oh, one following. Amazing. And I was like, mate, this must, it, it means that uh, we're on the right track. Mm. And so we've got one episode out with Mac Horton. So he's an Olympic gold yep. medalist swimmer yep. um, in Rio. He won gold in Rio and he's a great guy. So these, the whole conversations will just be about talking to friends and talking to athletes to normalize the stigma and take the stigma out that's, of the conversation. That's awesome, Because, man. mate, all of my idols and role models growing up were athletes. Mm. Like my Paul Harrigan, the guy who I wanted to be like, he was the toughest player on the field, but he was the nicest guy. Like he was the captain for New South Wales in the state of origin. Um, Newcastle, great. And so these guys who I looked up to, I was like, well, if these guys are having the conversation, if like for us now, like athletes, these days, you, like guys, you're your mates. Like imagine if we're having these conversations now we're broadcasting and we're showing everyone. Oh, well, man. for everyone else, it's like, well, I can resemble with that and that's yeah. cool and that's fun and that's fucking normal. Yeah. Like that's what we need to be doing. Yeah. Um, so that's the whole reason for the podcast and I want to try and, yeah, normalize it and, and just have like really fun, authentic conversations, which will be cool. Are you going to, I mean, sport obviously would be naturally a part of it, but are you like, are you getting just every day, like your mates on, you get getting people outside of sport. Is it'll what I'm be, trying to say here, or nah, is, it, like, is it mainly athlete orientated? It'll it'll be mainly be like athletes, sporting coaches, yeah. psychs. Like it's good because that's where your expertise are. Well, that's like where the, the boys. Yeah, that's yeah. where our mates are. <laughs> yeah, that's, <laughs> that's, that's true. That's where our mates yeah, are. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. So the underlying theme will be yeah, mental health and sport. Man, it's it's pretty special. I'm interested to know like how do you like because not everyone has a different definition because I think everyone understands what it is. But like how do how would you define like mental health? It's a hard one. It's really broad. I, know. I don't. I don't know. Like, you know, I like, cause naturally I think when people think of mental health, you think of someone struggling, yeah. Jackie Louder, Queen Jackie, I can't steal your quote, but she, she taught me what mental health was like in a sense of like, or how to think about it, I should yeah. say, is that it's conditioning, conditioning your brain and training your brain when you're feeling good. I love that. Yeah. Not waiting till you get bad. <sighs> I love that. And that's like, me like obviously that's aside from like mental illnesses yeah. and all that sort of stuff. But like mental health is like, we all, we all go to the gym, Yeah. but like the brain controls the body. Yeah. Why would we not yeah. do work on here where everything else can feel good? And when you're fit, do you stop going to the gym? Yeah. Like, yeah, well, exactly right. It's you like keep when you're feeling good, like, do you, should you not speak to people when you're feeling good? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Like Matthew McConaughey, he always says people, people journal when they're feeling bad. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's great. Actually. It's like I journal when I'm feeling good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, but that's the, that's the thing. Like I'm not going out there because I don't have the answers. Like I don't know what I'm no, doing. No, but that's the whole, it's, it, that's the find them. It's part of the journey. And so the yeah. whole thing is to like, come on this journey with me because I want to figure it out. Like I want to have the tools to be able to help my friends 
friends, my family, my inner community to help them. Like, yeah. and I don't have all the answers. So that's why I want to get these guys on to try and extract as much information as them. And hopefully it resembles or it relates to other people who are going through similar issues because each topic, each mm. guest, we're going to be speaking about something different. Yeah. Um, so hopefully it resembles with them and then it might spark the trigger for like, oh, well, I'm actually going to reach out to a mate or, oh, wow, I'm actually, I'm going through something similar. Yeah. Maybe I'll talk to this person about right. it. Right. So how, how was your own like mental health, would you say, like coming out of Parramatta? Like that sort of next 12 months of figuring out or accepting that, you know, you've been medically retired. Um, and also like the, what we sort of talk about on the show is like that identity loss and yeah. regaining a purpose. Yeah. Like how was that sort of period for you? Mate, I was pretty lucky. Yeah. I was, I was pretty lucky. I fell into something that I love, which, which helped me transition out of footy. So yeah. when I, when I finished up footy, when you get medically retired, you get your contract paid out. So I had 12 months to figure out what I wanted to do, okay. which is a godsend. Like I was so lucky. It's a great thing that NRL and RLPA put in place. So I was like, when I was going through footy, I did a bachelor of business. I started an MBA. Um, I tried everything under the sun. Yeah. I did a mortgage break. Like I tried working That's as a good. mortgage, like tried in fine dining restaurants, making cafe, like everything that I thought I might want to do. I was like, I'll just try it while I'm playing footy. Oh, that's the best advice. I just, I just, That's the it, best thing to do. It was great. And like, so anyone who's going through sport, it's like, you've got so many connections just being in that space. Just hit up friends and just be like, hey, mate, do you mind if I shadow you for a word? Like, I don't need paid. I'll just yeah. come in and help out. Yeah. Um, I remember I hit up Alex Labart um, in the black. Labart on the Gold Coast in Burley. It's a beautiful fine dining restaurant. I was like, mate, can I just come like help you prep on a Thursday? <laughs> <laughs> and he just laughed. He's, I know he's the best. He's just like, mate, can I just come? And he's probably, he just got me like peeling prawns or cutting tomatoes or something. <laughs> but it was cool to be in there. But then after that, I was just like, look, these, it's a, but you figure out like figuring out what you don't want to do is just as important as figuring out what you want to do in mm. my eyes. So when I finished up, I realized there's all these things that I don't want to do, but I still didn't really know what I wanted to do. It wasn't until I caught up with a really good friend of mine, Steve Dresler, who founded WhatAbility, who's the company I work for now. So what they do, they're a disability support service that concentrates on community access. So what we do is we take participants with all different disabilities out into the community to just have fun. So we'll go swimming, surfing, bushwalks, arcade, taking them to footy games. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. what makes it really cool is that we employ a lot of part-time and full-time athletes as support workers. That's amazing. So that's my role. So my Quite role- Quite a few of, uh, we've had a few on this show, I reckon. Really? Kelsey. She's, Kelsey, she's yeah. One. Yeah, yeah. Kelsey's the best. Uh, but but Braden's definitely one. Bruzzy, yeah. yeah. Bruzz is great. So these guys, and that's the- it's, tying it in like it's the whole thing so my role as athlete manager is to go and present to teams that's why i'm here in melbourne present to teams who are looking for flexible employment around training and that's easy because everyone needs flexible employment when you're training at a high level mm. but then also those really top tier guys who you know don't really need to do it for cash but they do it because they love it and it's mm. a great give back and it's really good to get out of that little bubble of professional sport um so the transition out of footy is I got to fall into something I love. Mm. Like I didn't know, like Steve, when we caught up, we just caught up for coffee as mates. Like right. we were just mates having a coffee and he's like, mate, what are you going to do now? I was like, oh, I'm not sure. He's just like, mate, come do a booking. Like come see what we do. And I did a booking and I'll never forget this day. Like this is the day that got me into this for the last like year and a half, two years. I mean, we went on this day with this participant who was really complex. Like we deal with participants who are really high functioning, who you might not know have a disability, but then also participants who are complex, who can't read and can't write and can't talk. Anyway, I went out with this participant with a really senior support worker and I won't mention the participant's name, but he really struggled with processes. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So he really struggled with processes. So just to get him out of the car was a 45 minute job. We were like unbuckle seatbelt, out of car, right. and iPad. And we used the iPad as like a reward for him to try and get out. Nonverbal, couldn't speak. Um, really struggled with process. Anyway, he became dysregulated. He ended up wetting himself, like full meltdown. And then I'm deer in headlights. With this two is your first, my like first experience of someone with a disability. I didn't have any relationship to anyone with a disability growing yeah, up, except yeah. for here and there. And I thought, and I was like, deer in headlights. I was like, what can I do? Do I need water? Like, what can I do? Like, do you need a towel? It's just like, the support worker was great. He's seen his voice. It's like, just relax. Like, we'll, we'll get him through this. And then we got him through it. We got him showered, changed. And then he gave us this huge hug to say thank you because he couldn't communicate, but he understood. He gave us this huge hug as a way of saying thank you. And like goosebumps. I remember thinking like, oh man, I was like, this is oh. sick. I was like, the smallest thing that we can do. Like that, we, he was like, that you felt that hug. We felt it hard. And then after yeah. that, I called Steve and I was like, mate, um, I love this. Like, oh, it's like my, like you talk about why, like, you know, how people talk about the why of like their life, I guess. Like Ben Crow talks about it. Emma Murray, it's like, 
your why is like outside of sports, outside of everything. So my why at the moment, I think is helping people through sport. That's why I want to do the podcast. Mm. That's why I like what ability because we employ athletes and we're also helping athletes, but we're helping participants and their families and their all community. So I think at a core, like I'll be, yeah, helping, helping people through sport, which would be cool. Mate, it's fucking, it's awesome. You've yeah. got like a, I reckon you've got a, like a modern day samurai skill. I don't know if you know. <laughs> no, but it's like, cause I think life has one constant, uh, life, life has one constant and that's change. Yeah. So I think a samurai skill in life is to be able to adapt to change. Yeah. Cause I never used to be able to be good at that. Yeah. Like, and I noticed it, like I've very, like everything needed to be on my sort of time and yeah. control and stuff. And then I realized wait, nothing's in my control yeah. and it's just, shit just keeps happening around you. And you've, the way you've moved on and bounced back, it's pretty impressive because why, why your story for me was fascinating was obviously you were achieving quite a lot in your youth career, but like I, when I was listening to some stuff about you, like you trained really hard from all reports to like get where you were. So what I, what I found out was that you would like train before you went to high school, like in the morning, you would do like running sessions and stuff like by your own decision. Do you know what I mean? Like little things like that. That's how much you wanted to get to the top. Then you get there and you get told after a few years, like if you keep doing this, it's going to be unhealthy for your own life like getting that critical news. And then you listen to you now, it's only two years on, just bounce back. I'm not saying it's rosy and perfect, like perfect, but like that's a samurai skill. That's, you know what I mean? That's cool. When you think about it, right? I've never heard anyone articulate it like that, but but I think you get it better than anyone because because you've been it. It took me six years. Yeah. That's why I'm looking at you differently. How are you, how are you feeling now? I feel great. I feel like that experience was the most powerful thing that'll ever happen to me. So there's a saying, and I'm, I'm fucking filled with uh, philosophy today. I like this a lot. Yeah. But (laughs) it's like, things don't, um, things don't happen to you. Things happen for you. And I didn't realize that with soccer until later on. And I don't know if it's like with your stuff, I I wouldn't sort of say that to you, but I think one day, like what you're opening up, like you will look back and that that'll resonate with you somehow because yours is really like unfair. But like, even, even for you, like, yeah, things happen. What is it? Things happen. Things don't happen to you. They happen for you. But like, you'll, you'll look back like, mate, you're a hundred episodes into this thing. And I yeah. know, and I can see the passion that you get out yeah, of this, having conversations with crew. Like it's so, it's so important. And I've heard you say like, you're going to be doing this forever. Like you could yeah, do this yeah, forever because yeah. you love it yeah. and you wouldn't have had these skills or this passion without all the prior experiences Correct. that you've already had. Like, Correct. and you can resemble with athletes who are coming out of the sport now because you've been there, you've been that athlete, but you also been that guy where it's like, oh, well, maybe I could have done a little bit more or mm. I'm sick of foot. Like how many guys are in footy who don't like footy? Yeah, it's, that's that amazing all as well, the time, isn't it? Right? It happens it's all like, the time. They fucking, yeah. Do you know, this isn't, Bo McCreary loves footy, everyone, so don't quote me on this, but like <laughs> he doesn't watch it and yeah. people like, that's normal for, like when you've been in it, you know players that are like that. Yes. But a lot of people hit me up and they're like, how do like professional athletes not watch their own sport? I'm like, it's because they're doing it for like six hours a day. Well, it's like you ask a plumber, are you going to watch plumbing videos like in your spare time that's a great one like, I'm like that's all, a great all one. my best mates that I played footy with like a lot of them didn't watch footy or like some of them didn't even mm. like footy but they were just good at it and it's a really great way like they might have they might have not liked watching it but they liked the competitive atmosphere and they liked being able to be fit and healthy and being around the boys all day which is great but yeah when people ask like did you ever watch footy I was like I don't watch that much footy like when mm. you're doing it all day every day you kind of get a little bit over it yeah. um, but there are some some crazy guys like Daily Cherry Evans and boys who are just obsessed and I watch every single game. And yeah. That's, yeah, why, that, that, Smith, that's why they're the best. Yeah. 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 They, they love it. Yeah. Um, before we round out, just this, this is a bit of a broad question, but do you think we're getting better as a society with um, like the stigma around males, mental health in regards to like, we're having discussions on open platforms and that's important. And we're putting it out in the stratosphere, but like behind closed doors, like when you're one-on-one, do you reckon that's improving in our society? And I'm not saying you're the expert, but like just your intuition, you're obviously around this space a lot more than I am because I'm I'm attached to that space a little bit to like want to see that improve. And I don't yeah. know if we are. Per, like I don't know if it's because I'm in the space more and I'm open with my own vulnerabilities. Therefore, my friends are more vulnerable with me. Mm. I can see over the last 10 years that it's changed 100%, especially mm. in sport. Like I talk to old boys that, you know, were going through the rugby league, even AFL system back in the day. Like they're not talking about their feelings. They're not talking about how they feel. It's a very much a hard man sport. Yeah. And a great example mm. was when COVID hit. 
the, and uh, like the storm, the mm. Melbourne storm, which is a great example. Remember Nico Hines came in to the team and was just like, we're not having conversations. Like some guys are really enjoying being in the bubble and you know, we were, they were with the team, like they were in the, their own secluded bubble. So their families weren't with them. It was just the boys. Like they were just with themselves. It was a coaching staff and the boys. And they're like, all right, well, some guys are really enjoying this because you get to be around the boys, but there's some guys who are missing their families and no one's having these conversations. So what he did was he, you know, spoke to this coaching staff and this is like secondhand information from Aaron Booth, one of his best mates who was there at the time. And he was just like, all right, well, let's just all sit around in like groups of four and five. We'll have a list of questions and let's just like talk about how we're feeling. Mm -hmm. And I remember talking about this with Boothy a couple, a couple months ago. And I was just like, there is no way 10 years ago that like boys would have been sitting around <laughs> talking how they're feeling yeah, in the cans. system. And so, and so I think, yeah, it, it has it changed a hundred percent. Do we have a lot, like a long way to go? 1000%. Mm. But that's why these conversations are so important. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think it is changing, but we've got a long way to go. Right. So where can people find uh, Keegan and Company podcasts? Uh, Keegan and Company podcasts. We're on Instagram, Spotify, yep. YouTube, um, podcasts. Oh, beautiful, okay. man. I think that's, I think it's going to be, it. it's going to be, I reckon you're in, you're, you're falling into your space, bro. I'm really excited. Yeah. Man. I'm really you, excited you, to have some good conversations. You've got a really powerful story, man. And I, um, I'm glad you're out of the game by the sound of it. You obviously was, was the right thing to do, but more so because it seems like your ceiling's much bigger outside of it, which might be hard to fathom now or in the future. But I think you, I think you can achieve more because it's such a, bigger and more powerful space in some regards what you're going into well mate thank you very much thanks for having me like this is really cool and like for you to go 100 episodes as well on the Unlaced yeah. Podcast mate, mate that, you've that's got to get 100 now bro. That's, <laughs> or else, that, well, mate, or else I'm going to call you and mate, you're you someone I look up to now so, <laughs> nah, so nah. Mate, no, thank you for having me it's um mate this is great this chat was great I do have to give you one question though because I think I know the answer is um fan favorite resilience driver ambition it's a bit of a slogan we run with it's like they're the three we attest for like success, yeah. all three of those like key pillars of people successful in sport or business. But I just want the one that resonates the most with you in your journey, which probably even today looking forward, resilience, driver, ambition, which one is sort of more pivotal to you? Do it's you probably resilience. Yeah, I was yeah, going to say that's huge, naturally right. Yeah, Hugh Vince Eigelberg, resilience project. Like yeah. he was huge growing up for me. So um, yeah, it's got to be resilience for sure. Beautiful. Keegan Hipgrave, thank you so much for coming on. Inspiring brother. And uh, wish you the best on your, your journey. Thank you, bro. Cheers, man. Cheers.